the Mark V Golf GTI was the saviour of the GTI, but could it also be the best GTI of all time? Hello guys and welcome back to the Volks Wizard channel. Today's video is a six in a series of eight celebrating 45 years of the Golf GTI. We've already covered every generation apart from the Mark II and Mark VIII. And for some reason, we've also overlooked the Mark V, but we're gonna put that right today. Now I know there's a lot of love for the Mark I and II GTIs in particular, but the one I love is the Mark V. Let me explain to you why. After the Mark I and II, which were brilliant GTIs, we had the three and four, which were not so good. Had the Mark V Golf GTI not been a success, VW would have probably canned the whole GTI model line forever, and we wouldn't have therefore had Mark VI, VII and VIII GTIs, which were brilliant. So for me, the Mark V Golf GTI was the savior of the GTI, but could it also be the best GTI of all time? Well, let's find out. Okay, let's start off then with a history lesson on the Mark V Golf GTI. It was revealed as a concept at the Frankfurt Motor Show in September 2003. That was roughly the time the normal versions of the Mark V Golf were launched. In fact, Wolfsburg for a week was renamed Golfsburg. Such was the significance of this new model. In September 2004, at the Paris Motor Show, a production-ready version of the Mark V Golf GTI was displayed and the order books opened soon after that. UK cars arrived in December 2004. I still remember seeing my first one very clearly at Listers of Stratford, but I'd seen a German spec car two months earlier in the October because Top Gear had asked me to supply a Mark III Golf GTI so they could have every generation of GTI there for when Clarkson did his review. And I asked him what he thought of it and he thought it was brilliant. And that was a very distinct change over his views on the Mark IV and quite probably the Mark III. So things were looking really good then. And as I hope panned out, the Mark V GTI was a distinct return to form for the GTI and sales were very, very good indeed. It was about £20,000 or thereabouts to buy a standard spec car. Uh, Edition 30, which was launched in uh, mid-2006, was about 22, I think, we're not covering that in this video because I think a 200 horsepower version of the GTI like this one is more representative, um, but there's loads of video content on that on my channel, so check that out. The GTI also made a return to the US. It hadn't been sold there for a while. The big difference with the Mark V was that it had multi-link rear suspension, which the Mark IV didn't have. It just had torsion beam, which went back to the Mark I. Volkswagen were disappointed with the reviews of the Mark IV, handling primarily especially compared with the mark one ford focus so they just headhunted the whole team that did the mark one's focuses control blade suspension and that's what we've really got on the mark five and that's why its handling was so much better they could balance ride and handling much better the guy behind that was kirsten shebstadt who still works for vw and that's why gti's have been basically consistently good ever since the mark five the engine's no longer a 20 valve, that was in the Mark IV, both turbo and non-turbo. It's an Audi engine really, the 20 valve, probably quite expensive, so they just went to 2 litre 16 valve and they went for a turbo, which in the case of the 200 horsepower car is a KO3, pretty similar to the one that was on the Mark IV, but producing 200 metric horsepower, 197 brake horsepower. Key options were leather, which we have in this example, Vienna leather, 18 inch Monza wheels, so basically a bigger version of the 17s that are standard and a diamond cut face. You could have navigation, was that a first? Possibly, it wasn't very good anyway, it was DVD based. There was a later version that was much better, uh, RNS 510, and um, yeah, but the first one was a bit clunky and quite expensive, over two grand. Cruise control, it's not a new thing really. Xenon headlights, you could have that on the Mark IV. And some very rare cars got tartan bucket seats. I think they were about a grand to go for cloth ones. If you paid, I think, over two grand, you could have the leather ones, but that was deleted in 2007. But even the standard cloth seats were much cooler than anything we had in the Mark IVs. Although, actually, for me, the favorite is the Interlagos Tartan with the part leather, as in the Edition 30. Right, let's have a look at the outside of this Mark V Golf GTI. 
Well, I know it's probably hard to believe today, but when the Mark V Golf was launched nearly 20 years ago, it was nearly as controversial as the Mark VIII. The Mark IV wasn't perfect. It didn't make a particularly good GTI, but it was a good car. It had its fans. I remember clearly everybody saying they didn't like the high roof line of the Mark V. It looked like a people carrier. They hated all the gray plastic inside. In fact, it wasn't just the plastic, the carpets, the leather even. It was all gray. If it had been black, it would have looked so much more expensive. We actually got that with the Mark VI. But after 20 years of buying and selling these cars, I can tell you why it must have looked cheaper than the Mark IV. It's proven a lot more durable and a lot more reliable. Now to make the GTI stand out from the normal models, there are a number of quite subtle changes, although at the time the grille treatment was probably the most dramatic for any GTI so far. Gone were the really boring slats next to the Volkswagen badge and a normal sort of lower section of the bumper. Instead we had like what's very much like the Audi one that had only just gone on to the A3 at the time, a big central grille and the honeycomb as well which has become a trademark of the GTI and never ever goes on an R model. We also got headlights with a black surround to them which quite subtle but then if you put the wrong headlights in the GTI it stands out really really badly got a VW logo in the headlight as well the wheels didn't sort of trade on the heritage of the GTI they're a completely new style but they just worked they're called Monzas these are the smaller 17s which were standard you could have them in 18s exactly the same style wheel just with a diamond cut face we got red brake calipers as well, which I think we're only on the Mark IV anniversary. Very subtle seal cover there, just in black plastic on the normal GTI. The tailgate spoiler is a little bit deeper. I had to look on Google very carefully just to confirm that, but it's probably about 30% bigger than the normal Golf, which has still got one that looks quite good. At the back, again, it's, well, it's a bit more subtle than the front, really. So we've got some nice twin tailpipes that was unique to the GTI at the time. And we don't have the Golf badge, we just have a GTI, which is really cool. The rear lights are the same, so yeah, it's pretty subtle. If you debadged it, it really wouldn't look that different, particularly if your exhaust tips went black, which they do within a few miles. So, that's it. A big difference, which we'll talk about when we go driving, is that the body shell on the Mark V was laser welded. And that meant it's just a lot more rigid than the Mark IVs, which used to creak and groan all the time when I used to drive in, particularly the stiffer cars like Anniversary and R32. So you lost the gutters here, which cause lots of problems with corrosion on some of the models. Right, so let's have a look inside the Mark V Golf GTI. Now I'd say it's probably a bit more subtle in here than outside, particularly as we've got Vienna leather, not the tartan. The tartan does give it the character that it's otherwise sort of lacking really, so there's no contrast stitching, there's no red on the seat belts, there's no red stitching on the steering wheel, there's no red stitching anywhere, not even on the floor mats. I've got sill covers there, but they don't say GTI. Let's get inside and see if there's anything else. We do have GTI on the steering wheel, but that is it. But we do have a flat bottom steering wheel, which was quite a thing back in 2004. It, I think, predated the B7 Audi RS4 by about a year, and it was a big deal when that had a flat bottom wheel. So I think up to this point, it was probably only Lamborghini, which is sort of very indirectly related. This car is DSG, which sort of transformed the desirability of this car. You had no excuse not to buy it because you could have it as manual, you could have it as auto, and the manual was really good. The, the Mark IV manuals, they weren't all that. So yeah, it's a tough choice, but yeah, there isn't a wrong choice, especially when you've got the paddle shifters here, which were, um, a pretty big thing back in 2004. So yeah, it's quite plain in here. We've got this sort of plastic aluminium. We do have dual climate control, which was um, I think deleted from some models later like the GT, but stayed with the GTI. And did you know, because it's dual and you can do the temperature differently, if you want to match it up to the driver's side, you just hold down auto. And there we go, it's the same. That's the effectively the sync button. They don't tell you that. Um, well, I'll probably tell you in the manual, but I don't think many people actually know it. Also, if you go into manual mode with the shifters and you want it just to go back into automatic, if you pull this paddle towards you, it goes back into drive within a few seconds. That's why it says off on there. That was sort of on and off 
with DSG for a few years, but the Mark 8 needs it because it stays in manual mode pretty much forever. Uh, we just got a normal key as well, which isn't a bad key, it's a flip key. I think that's pretty much identical though to the Mark 4, though we do have a separate boot release. Uh, black headlining gives it a sporty feel, you could say, so that's probably unique to the GTI at this point. And then we've got GTI actually in the leather there, so that's quite a nice touch. But yeah, it could do with a bit more colour, but then the Edition 30 gave you that. It gave you a golf ball gear knob, even a DSG version, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And I can't show you it today because for some reason it's missing, but the handbook was quite nice as well. It had a red stripe on it and it had the GTI logo. I think that was a first because we never had that on the Mark IV. Another nice thing about the Mark V, and it applies to every model, is that you've got a useful extra amount of legroom for rear passengers. So Mark IVs were always quite cramped, but this one, this Mark V is in my driving position. And I am quite happy with that. Yeah, it feels really spacious and that's the benefit of the high roof line. Okay, let's finally have a look under the bonnet. Okay, under that massive engine cover that looks like it would house a V6 is actually quite a small two litre four cylinder 16 valve petrol turbo engine. In this early car, it's AXX coded and it produces 197 brake horsepower, but it's more the torque that defines this engine as we'll find out when we go for a drive. It's one of the EA113 generation of engines that survived until the Mark VI when that was fitted with one of the first EA triple eights and EA triple eight continues in various evolutions right up until the Mark VIII. So the big difference is that the EA triple eights have a timing chain that's good for the life of the engine. They don't have a cam belt that needs changing every five years or 80,000 miles. Now, I think it's very important we get the car up in the air and have a look at the unique selling point of the Mark V Golf GTI, its multi-link rear suspension. Okay guys, well this is where the magic happens on the Mark V Golf. So this is its multi-link rear suspension and it's fully independent so that this side of the car isn't connected to this side. These arms pivot just here. On a Mark IV Golf, this side is connected to that side with a torsion beam and that makes it much harder to tune the ride and handling balance. That's why if you had a good handling Mark IV, it'd generally be quite a stiff ride. That's not the case on a Mark V. You never got adaptive suspension either, it was what it was, and with 17 inch wheels, it worked just fine. So if you look underneath a Mark I Focus, you'll probably see something that looks very similar to this. That's called the control blade suspension, but I'd guess that it would be quite a lot rustier at um, oh, 17 years old. Well, this looks still pretty good being a Volkswagen. Let's just have a look at it from another angle. There we go. Right, well, you've seen every bit of the Mark V Golf GTI. Let's now go and see how it drives. Well, it's a very interesting exercise getting back in a Mark V Golf GTI after a year of not driving one and pretty much exclusively driving a Mark VIII Golf GTI. On first impressions, they feel pretty similar. The driving position feels identical. That's good because it's good in the Mark VIII. We've got loads of adjustment of steering wheel reach and rake and the seat goes up a lot or goes really low if you want that sporty driving position. Like me, we've got electric lumbar, which is actually swisher than the one in the Mark VIII. That's just a lever, which is simple, does the job. We've got sort of this four-way adjuster button down here, which means you can finely tune the seat. And that's important because a good chassis needs good seats. And much like the chassis improved in the Mark V, so did the seats. I didn't really like them in the Mark IV, even the Recaros. They always seemed on me anyway to leave a lot of um, space up behind the top of your back, while these just sort of follow you back all the way up to pretty much your neck. So they are perfect. They're not overly buckety, but they look a bit sporty and they're quite supportive. They're a very well judged seat in that respect. A big difference at slow speeds is that steering is noticeably heavier. We've just got a purely hydraulic rack, not electric one like in the Mark 8. And that reminds you you're in something a bit sporty. Um, but when you get on a good road, as we will do shortly, it, it feels a lot better than the one in the Mark 8 when it comes to communication. It's actually reminded me how good the steering feel on these is. 
the market's really easy to maneuver because it's so light and it does weight up when you need it to on a good road but this still knocks it for six when it comes to feel at the engine we've got 200 metric horsepower i think the big factor is how torquey it is so at around 2000 rpm it just goes the turbo just kicks in and it's so responsive but if you flick a few paddles on this car it likes to rev it's not effervescent at the top end but it's not reluctant either so it's a good a good combination if you really want to open her up you can and enjoy that if you just want to plod along like normal people do in cars it's perfect and that brings me on to the DSG gearbox while well, it helps the acceleration by about 0.3 of a second 6.7 versus 7 of the manual the most important thing is that it increases the usability of the car so we don't have any driving modes, although we do have sport mode on the gearbox, that's best left alone because that just makes it change gear at higher points. And if you really want to drive sportily, you just use the paddles, which were standard fit on this car. So it was actually the first Golf to get the DSG for the UK market. The Mark 4 R32 had it elsewhere. So it was quite a big thing to have a uh, flappy paddle gearbox like Michael Schumacher did at the time in his uh, Ferrari. But yeah, if you're not into that, if you just want, just want to drive it like a normal person, just let it do its thing in auto and it's super smooth. It also helped the MPG and CO2 emissions a little bit as well. Interestingly, it's not an awful lot slower than the Edition 30. So if you go for a DSG 200 horsepower car, it's only 0.1 of a second behind an Edition 30 manual. Obviously, if you tune them, the Edition 30 is faster, but actually, and I know this from painful experience, having tried to drag race a tuned Edition 30, it's very hard to make them go any faster than the stock 0 to 60 time because you're just limited by the traction. got front wheel drive you haven't got any clever technology helping you put the power down ESC has improved on this generation of car compared to Mark 4 where it would cut the power abruptly you can almost not tell it's doing it but it is and you can turn it off I think it goes off largely unless you're gonna have a big skid and then it kind of helps you out now obviously the big difference with this car was the suspension so we also got though and this doesn't really make the headlines as much a much more rigid body shell and that's crucial to allowing the advanced multi-link suspension to do its thing and with that this car is just a the perfect balance of ride and handling bear in mind we don't have dcc you don't really need it we're on 17 inch wheels here push take on on a truck we're on 17 inch wheels on this car and you could get 18s but the ride just went sort of the wrong side of comfortable with those and you didn't get any more tire on the road there were still two two fives on these 17s yeah they don't look as good but i think they would this car was designed to run these particularly in the uk they brought the mark 5 development team over to the uk to tune it for our roads and you can tell it it rides great it's not as precise as the mark 8 no way um, but as a road car it's quite hard to beat as i will demonstrate now i, I drive these roads in my market a lot and the corner speed <laughs> maybe not on that corner but generally it's the same uh, speed of over reads by about 10 percent so you think you're going faster than you are but i'd say there's not a lot in it in the corners in this car and that's because the basic hardware of this car is pretty much the same as in the mark 8 and that's because the development team that was headhunted from Ford, who did the Mark 1 Focus, were brought over for the Mark 5 and they've put their magic on every GTI since. So there is a common link between this directly to the Mark 8, but I think the brief for the Mark 8 was quite different in that they wanted it to perform better on track and chase lap times at the Nürburgring. And that's probably at the expense of how good it is on the road, which is a bit disappointing because GTIs should be all about the road. This car's reminding me what a GTI 
should be all about. If you want to go and track in the GTI, you do what people have been doing for years, you modify it. Having one that's track ready out of the box is a bit wrong. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Back to this car then. So we've got 312 millimeter brakes up front. That's actually the same with the Edition 30. And as I said, they're perfect for the road. If you want to go and track, you need to modify them. They work great. So this road's got some nice corners in it and it's a 60 mile an hour road. The speedo says that, but we're probably doing closer to 55. I've done this loads in my Mark 8. It's what happens when you turn in. There's definitely a lot more roll, but it settles pretty quickly and it does give you a lot of confidence. It's, it talks to you a lot more than a car that just corners flat like the Mark 8 does. Plus the steering talks to you a lot more. And the engine, when you start working it, it does make an authentic noise. There's zero fakery in this car. But if you're a normal person driving it, like people do in GTIs, you wouldn't really notice that noise because you probably never go above 3000 RPM, particularly in normal drive mode with the DSG. Oh, it feels so great. This corner, always a tricky one. It feels nice and small as well, which is kind of useful. Yes, yes, yes. It may not be as fast as the Mark 8, but I think it's just as much fun and at saner speeds. But most importantly, it's reminded me what a GTI is all about, and that's nothing to do with going on track. It's all to do with the roads. So is the Mark V Golf a GTI the best GTI of all time? Well, I don't think so. I think if you judge it on price alone, it's probably the best value GTI you can buy today because the classics have rocketed in value, while the Mark V, which is still a very good GTI, is still resolutely in bargain basement territory. But as for the best GTI of all time, today, for me, that accolade goes to the Mark 7.5 GTI performance because it sticks closely to the original GTI remit of classy performance. It doesn't go too far in the name of hardcore chasing lap times like the Mark 8 Golf GTI. It doesn't have sort of tacky boy racer bits on it like the Mark 7.5 GTI TCR car I love. And it's got as much performance as you can need. I know that from painful experience. I did a car wire drag race in my Mark 7 Golf GTI Club Sport S, the Nürburgring ring record car, and I got beaten by Mark 7.5 Golf GTI Performance DSG because it just had more traction. So I had a lot of respect for that car from that day onwards. So yeah, for me, if I had to have one car, it would be a Mark 7.5 GTI Performance, probably. DSG. Anyway guys, thank you as ever for watching this Volks Wizard video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Please do comment. I do try and read them all. Please do share and please, please do subscribe. We're about a thousand away from 40,000 and that would be a very momentous moment for the channel. And I'll see you for the next one very soon.